This podcast of This American Life is supported by you. Well, maybe. If you go to our website where you can download or stream video of our recent live show, it's nearly two hours long, including stuff that was not on the radio or podcast and lots of stuff that has to be seen, not just heard. A Broadway style musical with full choreography, not one but two mini operas, Mike Birbiglia with a person in a mouse costume, roller skating, Sashir Zameda from Saturday Night Live, songs by Stephen Merritt of the Magnetic Fields, costumes, sets, surprise guests, all captured by six cameras yours at thisamericanlife.org if you want it. Thanks. In October 2003, a guy was brought into the psychiatric emergency room at Bellevue Hospital in New York City. Dr. Joe Gold was the chief attending psychiatrist that day and saw him. He felt that his life was essentially a reality show, uh, that he's been recorded uh, for years, that everyone in his life um, was an actor reading from a script, and uh, he came to New York essentially to test this hypothesis. He thought that maybe 9-11 was faked, just to get a reaction out of him on reality TV. And if he came to New York, uh, and if the World Trade Centers were still standing, he would know that that was in fact the case. If in fact um, they had been destroyed, then he would admit that perhaps he was delusional. But once he got to New York, instead of visiting the Twin Towers, he walked into the United Nations and asked for asylum. Asylum from a TV show that was filming him without his consent, 24 hours a day, which, you know, is how he ended up in Bellevue. Dr. Gold didn't think much of this. People show up at Bellevue with lots of weird delusions all the time. And then a few months later, another guy walks in with the same idea, that he was being filmed 24-7 and broadcast around the world. And the second guy, like the first one, mentioned a film, the 1998 movie The Truman Show. Both of them uh, named The Truman Show, um, you know, by name. They, they, they said, my life is like The Truman Show. Truman is played by Jim Carrey. He's filmed all day, every day, on a program that is broadcast to billions of people around the globe. His wife, his best friend, everybody around him is an actor. Everybody knows it's a TV show but him, until one day he starts to see clues that make him suspicious. And just to be clear, you're not saying that The Truman Show necessarily triggered this. Like, people watch The Truman Show and suddenly something in their brain snaps. Yeah, exactly. On the contrary, I think it's just um, when people are becoming psychotic, things feel a little bit unusual, a bit odd, but what would explain all this weirdness? And perhaps if you've seen the movie and that's kicking around your head, you might say, yes, this is it. This is what's happening to me. If your psychosis includes both paranoia and a sense that you are very, very important, what psychiatrists call grandiosity. 30 years ago, you know, you might think that the CIA or the KGB is watching you all the time. These days you have another possible explanation, reality TV. A few months later, a third patient showed up with the same delusion, and a few months after that, a fourth. Dr. Gold started calling it the Truman Show delusion. He's just written a book about it with his brother Ian called Suspicious Minds. In one case in the book, a patient, a super smart guy, an academic, very altruistic, believed that he was part of an elaborate game show, and the world was watching him and betting on everything that he did. And this was a really fun thing that everyone would be doing online, uh, and the money is collected would go to charities uh, all over the world and that every single human being on earth would be given some amount of money and the world would be, you know, bettered for it. One of the things that he included in his delusion, you write in your book, is that he has the thought that he actually Mm -hmm. was the mastermind who created this game show that he was on and that he controlled it and he knew the rules when he had originally created the show But somehow he had forgotten that and all the rules, which is so interesting because, of course, it's true. Like, he did invent the game (laughs) show, and the only fact that he's missing is that it's not real. It's all in his own head. That's, that's, uh, yeah, an interesting way uh, of putting it. It's, it is kind of fantastical. And heartbreaking. It like, is. Like, part of him knows he Absolutely. made it up, but he can't grasp he the whole reality. He does not remember. At one point, he suggests that he told his best friends, this is what I'm going to do. You're going to run the show, but you will now hypnotize me, and I will forget what we're talking about now so we can do this really good uh, deed for, uh, for humanity. Some of these patients respond to treatment, some don't, same as with other delusions and psychoses. But Dr. Gold says that if they do come back to reality... 
some feel uh, great relief if they if they've been persecuted. Um, it's quite embarrassing uh, if you think about it. Every moment of your life, I mean, when you're in the shower, uh, you know, literally everything is filmed. Um, so they feel quite good about it. At the same time, there's a certain sadness that um, they're not particularly important. Do they miss being the most famous person on the world? No question. There are some who feel um, that that's a huge loss. Uh, at the same time, uh, I think you know they, they return to the notion that they're mentally ill, which in and of itself is um, is an unfortunate and sad thing. Psychosis aside, I think all this illustrates so clearly. You know, there's a downside and an upside to being on stage for the whole world to see a human spectacle against your will. And today on our program, we have people who became just that. They have an experience, you know, so few of us have that we all get to see from afar. They are on display for everybody and not because they chose it. What that feels like, the positive parts and the negative side and the real life reality of the whole thing. From WBEZ Chicago, it's This American Life, distributed by Public Radio International. I'm Ira Glass. Stay with us. Taquan, I am the eggplant, cuckoo kachub. In the TV genre that's devoted to pure human spectacle, reality TV, you know, people fight drunkenly in hot tubs, they eat live spiders for money, but none of that can hold a candle to this show, a show that aired in Japan all the way back in 1998. It was called Susanoo Denpa Shonen, and one of its segments in particular got the attention of one of our producers, Stephanie Fu. The segment is called Sweepstakes Life. It starts the way a lot of these shows do, with a bunch of people at an audition. One guy beats out everyone else. He's 22 years old, a comedian just starting out in his career. His name is Nasubi. Nasubi. Nasubi means eggplant in Japanese, a nickname he got because he has a long face. The producers tell him they have a unique idea for a show, something they've never tried before. It may or may not air, but if it does, He'll be the star. He'll be famous. The producers blindfold him, put him in a car, and take him to a small apartment. Then they tell him to take his clothes off. That wipes the grin off his face. It wasn't just my personal sort of shame or, or, or sort of issues about, about nudity per se. My dad is a cop. And when I first announced that for, you know, my career choice was going to be comedy, you know, he, he was not thrilled. And we had to go through some things to get him around to the idea. Uh, he said, you know, the one thing that I must never do in public is strip. Oh, no. <laughs> so there I was. And then this guilt towards the, I was breaking the promise to my father it, as publicly as possible. But he strips. He grabs a pillow, holds it over his groin, and looks around the room. There's no chair in the room, no bed, just a coffee table, and magazines, tons of magazines. The producers tell him that from now on, if he wants food, clothes, he will have to win them by entering sweepstakes in those magazines. They give him postcards to send in for prize drawings. He'll be freed from the apartment after he wins one million yen, or... $10,000 worth of prizes. Until then, he isn't allowed any outside contact with the world. He can't call his family. He can't talk to friends. And oh, they tell him, don't forget to put tapes in this little camera here every two hours and record yourself. We'll come pick up the tapes once a day. Then they say, all right, later. Nasibi screams, are you for real? <laughs> Nasibi says he'd signed no contract, but he didn't have anything better to do, so he sat down and wrote, and soon was entering two to three hundred contests a day. And while he waited for prizes to arrive, he had no food. Nasibi got frighteningly thin very quickly. You could see the sharp angles of his collarbones. Well, starvation is a good word for it. Um, the staff got together and would give me basically a very uh, simple uh, little bread uh, each day. Um, so I had bread and water essentially for the first two weeks. But then as soon as, I, as the results started to come in, 
then that stopped and, and everything shifted over entirely to the things that I could win th- through sweepstakes. After two weeks, he finally won some sugary drinks. A few days after that, he won a bag of rice. When the postman dropped it off, it was like Christmas. Nasby danced like a madman. Were you trying to be a good performer and be funny when you were doing that, or was it just really genuine joy? Well, initially, of course, I was there as a performer and I wanted to be a comedian. And But somewhere in the middle, you know, the whole business of staying alive became my full-time occupation. Um, so I think what you saw, if you saw the any dancing, it was really just a human being expressing, you know, great joy. So he danced for this package of rice. But then he stopped short. He realized he didn't own a pot to cook the rice in. But after a couple days of failed attempts, he figured out that if he put some rice in an empty drink container and left it near his single gas burner, it eventually turned into a kind of porridge. And I could eat delicious rice every day. I remember how good that felt. And then there was the slow trepidation as it started to vanish and then it ran out. And um, the only uh, food substitute that I had been able to win in a sweepstakes was dog food. You know, after, let's say, six weeks of eating dog food, when then I, I was able to get more rice and it arrived, I really felt a, uh, a kind of uh, special kind of joy um, at being able to sort of return to humanity in a sense and, and taste delicious rice again every day. Back then, there was a kind of sweepstakes mania in Japan. The country was in the middle of a terrible recession, and some wondered whether one could subsist entirely on their winnings. And so when sweepstakes life debuted, almost immediately after Nasabi was first shut in the room, it was an instant hit. Nasabi had no idea. He didn't even know he was on TV. He believed what the producers had told him, that he'd record some videotapes and maybe someday it would end up on the air. On television, Nasabi's groin was hidden by a purple cartoon eggplant that floated around as he moved. Everything he did was accentuated with ridiculous boing-boing sound effects and puffy rainbow letters floated above his head. But these effects popped up just as often when Nasabi was despondent. The show took every chance to poke fun at him, whether he was muttering to himself, dancing around, or doing terrible headstands. You know, the dumb stuff you do when you think no one's watching. Except people were. For context, in the U.S., Game of Thrones usually has around 9 million viewers. Nasubi had 16 million, in a country less than half the size of ours. People thought Nasubi was the funniest comedy act they'd ever seen. And I have to admit, as a viewer, once in a while, when Nasabi got something really awesome in the mail, I couldn't help it. I laughed too. Even though I knew how much he was suffering, I couldn't help it. His unfiltered joy is contagious. Though, as a foreigner watching Sweepstakes Life, most of the time, when the studio audience cracked up, I felt sick. I thought, what could possibly be funny about this? I mean, that was maybe a time when... You know, Japan was 